Distinguished colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. Welcome to this special session of the 24th session of the Commission on Science and Technology for Development, CST. This event, Conversation with Great Minds, is an eagerly anticipated segment of our Commission's annual session, where we hear from eminent scientists, including Nobel laureates. The conversation, which is usually the curtain raiser for our annual session, sets the tone for discussions on the pressing science and technology policies of our time. Our commission is known for stimulating discussions on what is new, what matters, what is changing, what is the impact, and how this affects development a sustainable future for all. In this context, two renowned scientists will momentarily discuss issues from the field of biotechnology. I'm delighted to introduce the esteemed speakers of our great minds for this year's session. Firstly, I'm honored to introduce one of the co-pioneers of the revolutionary CRISPR gene editing technology, 2020 Nobel Prize winner in chemistry, Dr. Jennifer Doudna of the University of California, Berkeley. Dr. Doudna, welcome to the CSTV. Thank you. I'm also honored to introduce our second speaker, Dr. Katalin Koriko, Senior Vice President of BioNTech RNA pharmaceutical company. Her research on the genetic technology messenger RNA led to a breakthrough in fighting diseases, including against the COVID-19 virus. Dr. Kariko, welcome to the CSTV. Thank you. And I'm pleased to welcome back award-winning journalist, Ms. Didi Akinyarure, to moderate the conversation. Didi has been a Star Wars collaborator with the CSTV having moderated the previous two conversations with great minds. Welcome back, Didi. It's an honor to be here. Before I hand the floor to our moderator, just a quick note on housekeeping. This event is taking place on Zoom and is being live streamed on Facebook. After the initial conversation, we might be able to make time for a couple of questions. Those who are connected to Zoom, can type their questions in the chat box and time permitting, we can try to address one or two. I'm now pleased to hand the floor to our moderator, Didi, you have the floor. Thank you very much. And good morning, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. And for me, welcome to the conversation with great minds. My name is Didi Akinyalure and it's an honor to moderate this session. Ladies and gentlemen, today we are living in a world where recent advances in biotechnology is allowing us to tackle some of the most complex health challenges. From the revolutionary gene editing to CRISPR, successfully used to develop rapid diagnostic tests for COVID-19, to messenger RNA technology used to develop COVID-19 and cancer vaccines. And that's not all. The opportunities are there and the potential is huge. These biotech innovations are known to have transformative potential for tackling various sustainable development areas, from Ebola, cancer, HIV, malaria, to a food insecurity, to name a few. Biotechnology is a critical tool in achieving these sustainable development goals as these scientific advances have the potential to provide solutions to many of humanity's most pressing challenges. But while they open up new avenues of promising research, there are also concerns around inclusivity, ethics and regulatory concerns. There are questions that need to be answered and we must encourage an inclusive a global conversation around biotech innovation as this will inform public policy making, especially for developing countries where many of the challenges that these technologies um, promise to address are prevalent. So for the next 40 to 45 minutes, it's an absolute pleasure to join in the conversation and to tap into the great minds of uh, Dr. Jennifer Doudna and Dr. Kathleen Carrico. These are two 
powerful women breaking through the glass ceiling. Their contributions and scientific breakthroughs have in many ways allowed life to start to return to normal for some of us after months of the lingering COVID-19 pandemic. Dr. Jennifer, with the CRISPR technology now used in developing rapid COVID-19 diagnostic tests, and Dr. Kathleen's decades of research on mRNA, a once dismissed idea, now used in developing the Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna vaccines. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, please join me in welcoming Dr. Jennifer Doudna, Nobel Laureate in Chemistry from UC Berkeley, and Dr. Catalin Carrico, Senior Vice President at BioNTech RNA Pharmaceuticals. I'd like to urge our great minds to keep your answers tight. Uh, two to three to five minutes per on, um, answer would be an ideal time frame to keep in mind, as we do have quite a lot to get through over the next 40 to five. Um, uh, 45 minutes. So let's kick things off. I'll start with you, uh, Dr. Jennifer. As one of the co-inventors of uh, CRISPR technology, perhaps you could start by giving us background um, information on this technology, where we are now with it, and why it's so groundbreaking. Thank you, Didi, for that fabulous introduction. Well, the CRISPR technology is a way that scientists are now able to manipulate the DNA in cells and organisms in a precise and programmable fashion. So it's a tool that can be used to understand the function of genes like never before, but importantly, it can also be used to change the DNA in cells in ways that will have clinical impact as well as important opportunity offering uh, very important opportunities in agriculture as well. And I'll just give one quick example. It's already uh, a technology that's being used clinically to treat sickle cell disease, a, a disorder that has been known for a long time, has a well-established genetic cause, and CRISPR is being used to effectively cure this disease in multiple patients, demonstrating the, the future opportunities with this exciting uh, technology. Right. And Dr. Jennifer, I, I have to say this, you must be immensely proud of the contribution that this technology is making in the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. I mean, the past 18 months have been tough for all of us, and, and the pandemic is far from over in many parts of the world. But perhaps you could put into a few words what the past 18 months have meant for you and your work. It's been an extraordinary time, as you said, Didi, and I think for me, it's been a great opportunity to pull together with my colleagues at the Innovative Genomics Institute here in the San Francisco Bay Area to create a clinical testing laboratory at UC Berkeley that is providing a lot of the testing around our area for COVID-19. And also, as you mentioned, to develop new approaches to diagnostics for the future, one of which is based on the CRISPR technology. CRISPR was identified in research as, and it's found in nature as an adaptive immune system in bacteria. So it's quite appropriate, I think, to harness its, its power now as a diagnostic tool for COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Now, pretty much the same thing for you, Dr. Catalin. For, for those who are perhaps unfamiliar with uh, messenger RNA technology, perhaps you could tell us what it is, why it's so groundbreaking uh, in not just COVID-19 vaccine development, but in the development of cancer vaccines. Thank you. So uh, messenger RNA itself was exactly, was described 60 years ago, actually in the, in the nature of May. <laughs> 1961. And it took uh, 20 some years, we were be able, or scientists were able to make mRNA in a tube. And later on, very much uh, depending on the delivery system, they could uh, uh, introduce to the uh, different type of cells. And uh, scientists for, for decades tried to overexpress uh, therapeutic proteins and other uh, antigens and others uh, therapeutic value. And um, there was some problem with this immunogenicity that was, was our contribution to it to make the mRNA non-immunogenic. And uh, using this mRNA, like 15 years ago, we uncovered that how to make it non-immunogenic. You know, other scientists and companies started to use it and uh, for therapeutic purposes as well as for vaccines. And uh, the vaccine, which was developed for the uh, 
a coronavirus against the coronaviruses was not the first one prior to that already human trial was made also with in, against influenza with the same type of uh, vaccine and uh, for cancer there is a uh, more than 20 years messenger rna was in use of course you know we have to identify the proper target so it's still a challenging part but uh, many other application is already in clinical phase clinical trial uh, where mRNA, sometimes, you know, tolerization or sometimes induce immune reaction or just uh, coding for a therapeutic protein. And Dr. Katzen, like I mentioned at the start, and I mean, you just said it now, you know, you've been working on mRNA technology for decades and your research was initially dismissed. And here we are today, reliant on this technology in the development of vaccines in the fight against the pandemic. And your story is so inspiring. And I'd really like you to share that backstory or give us a summary that led to this remarkable breakthrough. So, so the... Um... Messenger, messenger RNA, because this is by nature is labeled actually the first papers described as unstable, you know, and then it is really unstable. But I try to see that uh, there is an advantage. Something is not stable because many things, including, you know, the spike protein, we don't want to do the rest of our lives. So it is good that it degrades the RNA gone and the protein is gone. So, um, so those uh, at the beginning, people try to use it for gene therapy and uh, and so they thought that, you know, this mRNA is so labeled, it, even in the shelf life, that it will be never be a medicine. And, um, you know, uh, we try to prove it <laughs> wrong. And uh, what is important that, uh, you know, I myself had always some colleagues who were enthusiastic and just like I was, and then we proceeded and didn't listen too much <laughs> of those who said that it cannot be done. And uh, we insisted to this project and, and, and you know, we had sometimes incremental uh, improvement and sometimes a big jump. And then it always gave us, you know, enough ammunition to keep going and improving the system. Fantastic. Now it's quite clear that these are, congratulations to both of you, by the way. It's quite clear that these biotech innovations are truly revolutionary, but there are concerns around uh, its use. And let's look at the controversial side uh, of things. The use of CRISPR editing in humans is a controversial topic that has raised ethical concerns. Uh, Dr. Jennifer, despite the fact that you have um, developed this technology, what are some of your concerns around its use and what are the requirements for developing ethical frameworks? Well, the CRISPR technology is extraordinarily powerful. It's, uh, as we discussed, a wonderful tool for research and for clinical use, but it, it, um, it also brings along with it certain ethical considerations. One is the potential to use CRISPR to make heritable changes in human beings. That can be done by modifying the DNA in embryos or eggs or sperm that are then used to create a pregnancy. So this is a, you know, something that became clear very early in the development of the technology as a possibility. And as many people may be aware, it's actually been used in that fashion uh, as was announced in, in uh, late 2018. And so I'm, I'm, uh, you know, been very involved over the last few years in increasingly global discussions around this, and um, and the the uh, need for the scientific community to pull together a set of of uh, universal guidelines that will, we hope, really um, guide the use of the technology in ways that could cause uh, real harm if used improperly. And I'll just quickly mention another uh, area of potential concern is the use of CRISPR in the environment to create changes that can spread quickly through a population, for example, of insects um, that could be beneficial if used to control the spread of disease, for example, mosquito-borne disease, but could also be, uh, have environmental impacts if this led to um, you know, destruction of, of certain environmental niches. Right, and Dr. Katzen, what are your thoughts around um, developing ethical guidelines uh, um, that sometimes um, around you know biotech innovations? You know, because of you know the concerns that sometimes uh, come hand in hand with these uh, innovations. I mean, uh, there are people concerned about uh, even the vaccine, the messenger RNA vaccine, that it will incorporate to the genome. But obviously, that um, 
uh, we know that uh, there is no precedent that uh, RNA from the cytoplasm would enter you know, into the nuclei. There is you know, a process, a biological process, reverse transcription, incorporation. So you know, those who are not knowing the knowledge, they don't have the knowledge that what it requires, they just believe it. And I try to explain scientifically to those that you know, not to worry, but because they do not understand uh, any of those uh, basic science. So it is kind of ending up to who, who the person is believing, whether I am believable, saying that it won't happen. And uh, so if it would happen, you know, all of mRNA is in the nuclei, they would reincorporate to our, uh, our chromosome. Our chromosome will be so huge and would change everything, you know, that uh, so, so people are, are concerned, I can understand because they have lack knowledge. And we as a scientist and as uh, yourself, as a reporter, we have to educate the public uh, better and use terms and words that they understand. And, um, and maybe they will be not as much concerned if they are more educated. Yeah, I mean, education is really important. I mean, um, Dr. Katana, I read that, you know, one of the reasons for the initial doubt uh, surrounding mRNA technology was the fact that, um, you know, its use in animal studies triggered dangerous immune reactions. Um, so, you know, I, I, I guess this is all about finding ways to mitigate, you know, those risks that, you know, may happen. So perhaps you could talk a little bit about, you know, what is being done at the moment. Of course, you know, you know you're still, you're part of this very crucial in the research around um, mRNA. So what are some of the steps that are being taken now to mitigate uh, risks? So, so indeed, the uh, messenger RNA was used even for vaccine in the nine, 1993, for example, but uh, the messenger RNA was uh, so immunogenic and it was not a good vaccine. So our uh, finding that uh, one of the building block, the uridin, is responsible for this uh, immune activation. We discovered that and we changed that. And what we changed, what we replaced this uridin, which is the one of the basic four nucleotide, we changed with the pseudouridin, which is an other form of uridin, which is present in our body. This is the pseudouridin is the fifth most abundant uh, nucleotide, nucleoside in our body. So we are not doing any chemical um, porine modification. So it, we made an RNA and actually 10 years later, it was discovered that our messenger RNA, which is in our body coming out from the nuclei also has pseudouridin. At the time when we incorporated that, it was not known that naturally we have that. So we are making an RNA, which is almost identical to what we have in our own body. So there is not a foreignness to it. It is everything is natural. And, um, and uh, uh, we are other structural element, which we incorporated is now is also, everything is a, a natural part. It, the mm -hmm. RNA looks like a, a, a natural RNA. It is just the difference that we are delivering from outside. But now that we're changing the, Uridine from delivering outside from the cell, the cell immune cells will not recognize that it is foreign. Mm. And um, I'd like to ask you the same thing, uh, Dr. Jennifer, you know, what we must do to mitigate the risk, because when you see, you know, headlines, especially concerns around gene editing that say, you know, gene editing could drive entire species extinct or create ecological disasters. And you see that in the news, it's very worrying, but um, what, what do you think we should do to mitigate those types of risks? Well, I agree with Dr. Carrico that, you know, a, a lot of it comes down to education and making sure that it's clear um, where the technology is today, where it's headed, uh, what, what's actually possible, um, and what's really science fiction. So, that, so I think that's critical. I also agree that we need to find ways to communicate about our science that are um, straightforward, so we're not using language that is unclear, using uh, words that are unfamiliar to people, because honestly, in the end, you know, I think what both of us are doing is uh, research that is, is, is very relatable to people, because it really does come down to, uh, um, you know, using um, molecules that are, you know, naturally occurring, and finding ways to use them to mitigate disease and to detect a disease in you know in in ways that are that are frankly quite safe if used appropriately absolutely i mean 
education is important and governments all over the world must educate um, their people and everyone must you know try to understand this uh, better and you know there are debates around politicians and regulation is another huge concern over how to uh, regulate the research around uh, biotech uh, innovation uh, Dr. Catalin, what type of enabling environment is needed to support such breakthrough research? And of course, you know, you've done, you know, so much research over decades, you know, in uh, mRNA. Um, in other words, what are the tools and policies that need to be in place to foster biotechnology uh, innovation? You know, when I would say, you know, to have some money for research, but in my life, I got only one grant. Oh. And, um, <laughs> so it was still important that at least, you know, other people get the grant. So that's, yeah. that's fine. And uh, as long as, uh, you know, they support the program, then, then it is good. And uh, so uh, I don't, uh, I, I find it, uh, you know, that uh, a lot of uh, reading in, in our sciences, most of the thing is like uh, analogy, that is there a precedent for that? And then how we further uh, come up with ideas. To, and um, so education, reading uh, and, um, and practicing. So for me, for example, even for education in elementary in high school was so critical that we did with our hands, different things, made crystals or took apart plants and, and other things. So that was the process. And then of course, in, in the laboratory setting is, uh, you know, practicing and good laboratory practice, which uh, helped and uh, a lot of reading and uh, I, I, I was at the bench, uh, I was 58 years old, I was still doing all of this experiment with my own hands. Uh, of course, because I didn't have money, so I had no technician, so I did everything. And uh, it, 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 I got a lot of ideas uh, doing that. So um, I don't know, <laughs> Jennifer might have <laughs> different experience, what helps. <laughs> Yeah, Jennifer, perhaps we could, you know, get you in here as well. Um, what are some of those tools and policies that you think need to be in place, you know, to foster these biotechnology innovations? Well, I, I think um, it's probably fair to say that for both of us and our lines of work, it was essential to have support, whether it was financial or in other, support in other ways that enabled us to do very fundamental research that ultimately led to these breakthroughs. CRISPR is a, you know, a technology that came from curiosity-driven science, small science, not big science, right? It was a small scale, um, you know, trying to understand how bacteria fight viruses, that type of, of question that led to the, the breakthrough in using it as a technology. And as we heard from Dr. Carrico, similarly with mRNA vaccines, it was research that goes back you know, many years that invested in understanding how RNA is recognized in cells, how it's stabilized, how it occurs naturally in our, in our bodies, as Dr. Carrico explained. So I think critically, we have to have uh, funding for that type of open-ended uh, research, but I'll also add that it's critical to also have ways to translate that into real world applications. And, you know, in my case, I'm, you know, I founded the Innovative Genomics Institute at UC Berkeley and UCSF for exactly that reason. We're a nonprofit organization within the university that helps scientists like me who do very fundamental work advance our discoveries in real world applications, whether it's in clinical medicine or in agriculture. And in the case of Dr. Carrico, obviously, you know, you have now, you are now working at a company that is at the front end of, of developing your own technology, which is very exciting. Mm -hmm. Dr. Carrico, would you like to talk about that as well? Tell us a little bit more. So I have to tell you that uh, moving from the university where I, you know, academic setting more than 30 years, and then going to uh, a small company at that time, BioNTech was a small company. We didn't have a, uh, even a website and it was 2013. I was so delighted somewhat that, uh, you know, the goal was not uh, more paper and other paper and other committee, something, you know, which was sometimes so, so uh, distracted from the real science of people. But uh, it, the goal was we have to make something which is, uh, which is helpful, useful, and help somebody to, uh, you know, 
and th those people are not asking that who made the drug, just have some kind of uh, drug that will help the person. And it was also what was for delighted for me that everybody worked together. There were not any more that who is the last author, first author, and immediately we don't even start in academic the work and already, you know, we are distracted that, oh, I'm not first one, second one, and what happens, you know, and it's because in an in a academic setting, you need uh, to get the grant, you have to be, you know, a lead author, the best paper, and here, there is no paper, just uh, some drug had to be useful, and that everybody pulled together, and then everybody's doing, and that, that was for me as a great delight that finally, okay, now we are doing this. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. I was so happy and I'm not mentioning now that with later uh, with the large, uh, you know, pharmaceutical company that their ability that how they can scale up, how they can run a trial. I mean, everybody has their own role. The university is uh, more flexible, small company can do the trans. Uh, transformation, translational part, and then large company can seize it and then help it and uh, bring to the people. So yeah. it was a delight, this course. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I like that you mentioned that because of course, you know, one of the concerns is, you know, how we scale these, you know, technologies in the first place, uh, you know, so obviously when you have big, you know, private companies, with lots of money, um, you know, you can do this research over time, over years, you know, lots of money can be pumped into it. Um, and in, in, in some countries in the world, you know, which is probably moving you know, to concerns around inequality, um, you know, these types of, you know, big uh, private companies are, you know, probably not, you know, in existence. Uh, or they're not targeting those companies. So um, I guess my question for you then, um, Jennifer, is um, I guess you could you know, make a comment on, on scaling these technologies and also scaling them to ensure um, that nobody is left behind in this biotech revolution. Yeah, that's a great point. So let's go back to the example of sickle cell disease that I mentioned earlier. As exciting as it is to see patients who are being cured using CRISPR, that technology today costs about $2 million a patient. So it's clearly not, not a sustainable, not an affordable uh, uh, price point. How do we get this to a point where it can help everybody who needs access to it? And I believe it's kind of a two-pronged approach. One is thinking about how we continue to develop the technology to be um, more, more accessible, uh, more widely available. So one of the things we're doing at our institute here is focusing on the delivery uh, technology for CRISPR, how we can deliver it into patients without needing a bone marrow transplant, uh, for example, uh, would be very enabling. And coming up with other simpler ways to introduce CRISPR into cells and tissues of clinical value, I think will be really, really important. But along with that comes uh, the scale, as you mentioned. Hmm. That's not something that we do in academia very well, and we, we, we're just not, it's just not, you know, we're not set up to, to um, sort of scale up manufacturing the way one would need to, again, to help reduce cost. There, I think we need partnerships with companies, and we have a number of uh, ways that we're working with our, our commercial partners to enable them to do the kind of scaling that ultimately will help drive down costs as well. Mm. And I know, um... Dr. Catalan, uh, you know, you've already talked about scale, you know, and scaling and, you know, working with, um, um, a, you know, big uh, private company like um, BioNTech, um, but I, I, I want you to, you know, make a comment as well about, you know, scaling these technologies to ensure that, you know, other people are left, um, are not left out of this biotech revolution, especially developing countries uh, uh, of the world. So, you know, the innovation itself um, uh, is important to, um, to include uh, those uh, other, other countries. So what, what happened, I would mention that 2013, the messenger RNA therapy meeting was organized by CureVac and uh, we gathered uh, in, uh, in Europe in Germany later every other year in, in the US. And we are inviting people from all over the world who are starting to make RNA and they need advice. Maybe they need how to scale up. So they, in these meetings, 
you know, we include from Korea, Iran, and other, other parts of the world, they are coming, and then they learn how to do messenger RNA, they might have a formulation, and they want to do experiment, and they can learn there from others, they know that what is the regulation, and how to develop a, a company, so not just that providing uh, some drug for them, but uh, learning, so they are, they will learn how to develop themselves, and uh, I thought that uh, we always took care of uh, small companies that uh, uh, could participate. We introduced them the, uh, that what they do, what they need, and uh, how to enter to trial. And uh, regulatory authorities are presenting on these uh, meetings. So uh, last year it was virtual, and uh, 600 uh, people you know, participated and learned that if they have some kind of molecules, whether they need RNA and they, where they could get, or whether they have formulation, where they could get the RNA or where they could get the formulation. So, so we, we, as a, we became a messenger RNA community. And what is interesting is that the smaller companies or who are participating and organizing like BioNTech, CureVac, Moderna, you know, we are rooting for each other because we felt that if the RNA fails in one company, that it's kind of the RNA fails and all of us fail. So we made sure that everybody is doing uh, good and uh, valuable. Yeah, and um, fantastic. And, you know, I want to touch on that as well. I've put with uh, Dr. Jennifer that, you know, education aspect, um, uh, working with other scientists uh, in development, um, in developing countries or organizations in developing uh, countries. Is this something that uh, you have done or you're planning to do with the uh, CRISPR technology at all? So I personally have not done that. I'm very interested in those opportunities. And um, I think it's been a little bit maybe early days, um, you know, with, with CRISPR up mm -hmm. until now. I think a lot of the, you know, we're still kind of really, really developing the, the technology at, at, the, at its fundamental uh, levels and learning about its capabilities. That being said, I absolutely agree that we want to see this uh, technology rolled out and, and um, labs around the world enabled to use it and to get access to it. And what are the best ways to do that? And I think, uh, again, as, um, you know, as we heard, it's, I think it's very valuable to have meetings that are open to everyone, that open up the opportunities to come and learn about this. Uh, one of the great things about CRISPR, actually, is that it's a technology that is widely accessible. It's, you know, that's one of the reasons it's, it's been so transformative. It's that it's not, it's not expensive to get a hold of it. It's uh, not, you know, incredibly uh, onerous to learn how to use it. And so I do think it opens up the door to making it available globally uh, faster than maybe certain other technologies have been uh, opened. Right, yeah, yes, I did hear about that, excellent. And um, I mean, we've talked about sort of private support. So we have these big um, tech companies investing in um, these innovations, uh, but I wonder what, you know, what, what's coming when it comes to uh, support from governments and, you know, the type of um, experiences that you have, you know, working with the uh, public sector, because, um, you know, one of the things that we wanna do is, you know, to engage, you know, uh, politicians to uh, support, um, you know, the research, um, uh, um, uh, biotech um, research for national uh, development. So I want to talk of uh, you to talk, I'll start with you, um, Dr. Catalin, um, what should governments be doing here? Or what should politicians, and I know that we have, you know, some of them, you know, uh, listening in, what should they be doing here to support research um, um, of um, biotech innovations in order to promote the commercialization of scientific research? Um, it's a good question. So, uh, so as I worked in the US and I work in Europe now for eight years, I can see a big difference that somehow that, uh, I don't know whether in the US they are teaching how to, those who are working at the university, are, the, if they have an idea, you know, spin out, <laughs> and they would uh, receive uh, support uh, from maybe government as uh, I also created a company once with Drew Weissman and uh, we get uh, government funding. And uh, so there is, uh, there is such a th such thing in the US and, uh, and also the private uh, investors are more likely to risk their money. And uh, there are almost, uh, you can see that uh, people with ideas immediately forming a little company, they are trying, pushing, 
and uh, somehow it is less so in uh, in Europe as I could see. But maybe uh, I am not. Uh, I was not in an academic setting in uh, Europe, but uh, it seems seems to me that maybe somehow has to help, uh, you know, the, uh, the innovation and giving money and supporting different ways. You know, here we are with Jennifer, both of us are women, we have child, you know, and uh, maybe helping also the women on a way that uh, they can return to to workforce and for this part uh, maybe Europe is better because here they have uh, maternity leave and fraternity leave and they can be away for one year and and the system is more supportive for in Europe in that aspect than in the US so yeah maybe both both sides can learn from the others and helping uh, uh, the women and also you know that they can be innovators and support financial support yeah for, yeah we're actually going to, you know, touch on that, you know, you know, being a uh, women and breaking through that glass ceiling. But I want Dr. Jennifer to, you know, uh, touch on that question as well. The types of support you've got from, you know, um, uh, from governments, perhaps in the U.S. Uh, what's been your experience? It's uh, it's very spotty in in the U.S. In my experience, and I think this is still the case that it's. Uh, very much uh, up to the individual institutions um, regarding especially childcare and affordability and access to childcare. I think, you know, things have gotten better over the time that I've been running an independent laboratory because when I started my career back in the mid 90s, there was essentially no um, provision made for maternity leave and certainly really none for paternity leave. No one had really heard of that. <laughs> now it's a, it's a, you know, it's a common expectation that when, a, um, you know, a family uh, expands, new child uh, is on the scene that, you know, both parents will have the opportunity to take time away for their family. And that's not seen as a, a negative. So I think that's been real progress, but I still think there's work to be done in terms of making childcare as you know as much as possible universally available and affordable yeah absolutely and i just wanted to ask one thing um what about from a regulatory environment you know so in, in terms of you know types of regulations because you 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 hear a lot of you know uh, developing countries talking about how they're not positioned um to benefit from advancements in biotechnology because there's just not a friendly regulatory environment that is provided so have you found it easier you know from say from a regulatory environment um uh, in your research uh, dr jennifer mm -hmm. Well, in my experience, um, again, it's kind of mixed. You know, I think that there's been a lot of interest in the in the CRISPR technology here in the U.S. And I've been, uh, you know, fortunate to attend a number of meetings at the Food and Drug Administration, for example, who are very eager to learn about the capabilities of this technology and really think about how it will be regulated going forward. What kinds of guidelines need to be in place for clinical trials, for example, that uh, will apply to a, you know, a technology that is exciting, partly because it can be personalized, but that also raises various challenges when you think about how to do appropriate clinical trials for those kinds of applications. Mm -hmm. um, on the agricultural side, just quickly, I'll mention that, uh, you know, I think there, my institute here has been very involved in uh, discussions with the US Department of Agriculture as well as with a number of agencies in Europe. And you may know that the uh, regulatory framework around um, CRISPR and other genome manipulating technologies in agricultural products is quite different uh, in different countries. So that presents its own set of challenges. Yeah, I wanna ask sort of a very quick question um, to each of you. Um, it's really, you know, what's next? What, you know, what is, is next for your technologies? What are you most excited about? If you go answer that in uh, maybe 20 seconds, uh, starting with uh, Dr. Catalin. Yeah, so, so that uh, I am very excited about that the mRNA will code for therapeutic protein because this is what I wanted to do from day one. I never wanted to do vaccine. It has just happened this way. So I am very optimistic about that. And also at BioNTech with... Uh, using messenger RNA for, uh, to treat autoimmune disease. And this is animal model where multiple sclerosis could be treated in the animal model. And then, mm. you know, many people, you know, waiting for that we would start a trial. So I am excited about that. 
All right, and Dr. Jennifer? I'm excited about increasing opportunities to have an impact in medicine and in agriculture and frankly also in climate change using, using CRISPR technology. These are all um, opportunities that are now in front of us given the rapid advancement of this, of this technology. And as we discussed, it's a, you know, because it, it is available to laboratories globally, it's a, it really does invite uh, global participation in that effort. Absolutely. Now, I want to ask one final question before I throw it to, question, um, to a Q and A, because there are questions coming in, and I want to leave five minutes for that. But you know, you're both successful women, remarkable, um, incredibly inspiring achievements. What is one tip that you would give to other female scientists that are inspired by your journey or story, Doctor Catalin? First. Oh, you, we don't have the whole afternoon to. Talk. <laughs> Just one word. <laughs> you know, just uh, you know, be be themselves. So and and you know, doing uh, their uh, work and not um, influencing. Uh, that was for me important. That do not let other people define me. And uh, I knew that what I'm doing is important. And then if people are saying otherwise, that uh, you know, listen what they say, but you know, which is not constructive. Just forget it and don't bother with that. All right. And Dr. Jennifer? My advice would be never give up. It's, you, know, you, have to, you have to have an idea and go after it. And if you're convinced that your idea is worth pursuing, you have to do that without uh, being dissuaded by naysayers. Ah, oh, thank you so much. Um, I just want to say a big thank you to both of you, uh, Dr. Jennifer Doudna and Dr. Catalin Carrico. Thank you for sharing your great minds with us today and for the revolutionary work that you have done and that you continue to do. Ladies and gentlemen, um, that's it from me. I urge you to continue the conversation wherever you are so that together we can encourage further innovation in the biotech sector with the goal of achieving a better and more sustainable future for all. My name is Didi Akia Lure. It's been an honor to be your moderator. And I'll pass over now to Peter. I guess there are a few questions. Thank you, Didi. Thank you, both Catalina and Jennifer. It was a great conversation. Uh, I have a few questions. I'm going to read out uh, the first one. I'm curious about the presenter's opinion about open science and pattern waivers. Uh, Dr. Jennifer, can you start? Sure. So um, yeah, this is a very, very interesting, very important uh, question because it does relate to access to technology, development of technology. CRISPR has been a, a very uh, interesting uh, case in point because it has a complicated patent landscape around it. There's uh, ongoing patent disputes about CRISPR. Uh, I would just say that, you know, in, in my experience so far, at least, the, those disputes have not impeded the progress of the science, which is very important. There still have been, you know, many, many um, companies that have been founded and uh, companies that have gotten access to CRISPR technology, as well as lots of nonprofit and academic groups that are using it. So um, in our case, at least, you know, the, the science really does proceed regardless of the um, the, the patent situation. Thank you. Kathleen? Yes, I, I am sure that in the mRNA field is the same. So the science can progress and uh, people can make messenger RNA tested out for different applications. I know that it has some kind of edge here related to the accessibility of uh, the vaccine for all, but uh, I also, you know, carefully read about uh, right now that um, maybe uh, making it free for all is uh, not the best way to provide as quickly as possible for vaccine for all of the others. Because, uh, you know, maybe it is very popular answer to say, but uh, I understand that what it takes to make a vaccine. And, um, and right now the companies, large companies in the position to, to provide. And uh, so, but I, I, I am not an expert, you know, I am a biochemist and I don't try to be, you know, <laughs> expert on everything. Yeah. Well, the next question. Uh, how do you see the advancement in computing such as artificial intelligence and quantum computing affect the future of drug discovery and biotechnology? Wow. 
So who, who will take it first? Artificial intelligence, co quantum computing, could it affect your field? And if so, I mean, uh, in yeah. what way? I, I mean, uh, the, we are using, and, and of course it uh, improves uh, selecting uh, uh, epitopes and others, you know, learning from the uh, clinical uh, results and seeing that how we can improve the better selection for the epitopes for cancer treatment and others, of course, uh, has important role. You agree with that, Jennifer? Yeah, I do agree with that. In, in our field, artificial intelligence, you know, algorithms are being used increasingly to mine out the kind of data that are coming from CRISPR-based studies that help us understand better uh, the, not, not only the function of individual genes, but really how they interact and you know, how they affect um, you know, everything from disease phenotypes to the way that any individual will, will respond to particular types of therapies and drugs. So it's, uh, I, I just see it playing an increasing role, honestly, in, in the development of, of therapeutics. Thank you. Well, uh, I think, uh, first of all, I thank Didi, and I think we have covered a lot this afternoon, and uh, I'm really very grateful to you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Doudna. Thank you, Dr. Kariko, for your presence and for your, your ideas and exchange. And uh, as you know, the whole session has been recorded, so probably uh, those who didn't have the chance to, to follow us, they can uh, uh, view it. And uh, I thank all the viewers who joined us. Thank you and uh, have a nice day wherever you are. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.